Afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome back to the Firefish Crowdcast, joining the dots. Um, I'm delighted I've got Claire Akers here, or Akers, sorry, um, to join us. Welcome, Claire. Thank you for joining us. Oh, thanks um, for inviting me. Oh, no, really excited because we've got, what a title. Come, come here to find out how to fire your clients. So I'm really looking forward to getting into that topic. But beforehand, you've got um, a wealth of experience. Um, you know, in, in, when we were chatting before, 15 years recruitment experience, you've worked for some of the most known sort of companies, Wolf and Wall Street environments, to then launching your own tech company. Um, and now you're sort of really on that mission to sort of look at what is the authentic recruiter. And you've built up a community, which we'll talk a little bit more about, um, of the, the authentic recruiter. And it's really, I think we have a joint passion, isn't it, in terms of trying to get sort of changes in this industry, which is what we're all about as well, and, and sort of actually recognise, you know, let's move the industry on about the type of business we're doing and the type of delivery that, that we're we're all about um, so thank you again for, for joining us and sharing some of your thoughts. So we're going to dive straight in, if that's OK. Um, yeah, so go for it. Firing clients, you know, <laughs> what, what at, at this stage, everyone's probably going, no, we're so busy. We need clients. We need to be dealing with all of these clients and these business opportunity. Why should we be looking at what does this mean, firing our clients? Well, it's a slightly controversial title. I understand that. And so I'm excited to kind of put some context around it and, and explain what I mean. So I have a, a kind of mission, if you like, which is authentic recruiters change lives. I mean, as recruiters, as, as veterans of the recruitment industry, we have got an amazing opportunity and responsibility to change the world. Um, and I believe that the way that we do that is by working with clients who light us up. Um, and I think far too many recruiters sell themselves short by working with clients that they're not really passionate about. Mm -hmm. So I guess the, the top line message, if you like, is to only work with clients who you are massively passionate about, um, that you are really, really excited about when you manage to find a candidate for them. You know, the kind of client who they'd call you at 10.30 at night and you, you take the call because you're excited to hear from them. I think it's only by working with those kind of clients and saying thank you but no thank you to anybody else, that's how we really, well, change the perception of the industry and really, and really have the impact that we want to. So, I mean, a lot of people out there and recruiters out there will be actually thinking that... How, how do I get to pick my clients? Because surely I just need to be dealing with anybody that gives me business. So oh, that's a dangerous thought. Mm -hmm. Now, that to me, if you were coming to me as a client, as a, as a, a if I was coaching you, that would be like a, a flash on, flashing neon sign above your head that we needed to do some work on your values. Because if you're feeling that kind of desperation for business, mm -hmm. we'd need to do some work on you valuing yourself and the value that you provide. But we could even think about getting you out there to, to find some clients. So, you know, I kind of thought about it in terms of, um, you know, clients that get you excited, clients that you want to do business with. So can you do take that a little bit step forward? It's like some of the recruiters will be working for a cus like a company that has those values. And then you've also got clients you just like, you know, so should the recruiters be having how, how do we be, be able to sort of assess a new client quite quickly to being one that is value that you want to excite you and light you up so i guess first step is knowing your own values mm -hmm. um and by that i mean well it, it comes back to authenticity so knowing who you are what you stand for and having the courage to live that every day um so that's the first step is knowing that i'm working for a company who matches that value so you're, you're employed by a company that matches that values, or if you can't find one, you start your own. Um, and only when you know that, then you go out and you, when you're taking a briefing off a new client or you're working with your existing clients, you're not just taking the briefing, you're asking the under the surface questions that allow you to assess whether there is a, a true values match there and you can connect with them, not just with your head, but with your heart and your gut as well. And that's when, that's when the magic happens as recruiters. It's almost like you're interviewing them a little bit, isn't it? Absolutely. I don't think enough recruiters do that. I think I think it's partly clients' fault and I think it's partly recruiters' fault, but there is a perception that uh, recruiters should be grateful for any business that they get, whereas we need to be elevating the service and really partnering with those people. And if we respect ourselves first, that's when clients will start to respect the service too. 
Yeah, because it's interesting. I saw somebody was running a poll on LinkedIn and they were asking, you know, how many jobs per week do you think is reasonable for a recruiter to be handling? And if you think about it like that, you know, you only have a finite time that you can give to your client base. So it's almost then looking at which ones deserve it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it comes back to your terms as well, doesn't it? If you know you're working with clients on retainer or exclusively, then, well, how much money do you want to earn? How much money do you want to bill? And you can you can actually work back what is your time worth and, and only say yes to, to assignments that you know you can do a really good job on and fill. So another thing that recruiters don't like doing is saying no. Okay, so say, for example, you do then start to assess your sort of customers and new business or new jobs and you get a client, you think this is just not going to work very well. Or you just got that bad feeling about I'm just not sure if I'm going to let them down. And it's not going to gel. How, how do you sort of coach or advise recruiters to actually, you know, get out of that situation and politely say no to their business? I don't necessarily think it's about saying no per se. It's about being really, really clear on what rules of engagement and what terms and what boundaries work for you. And if you communicate those to a client, they may opt out themselves or they'll agree. Um, but have you ever had that sinking feeling when you agree terms with a client and you just know it's... Oh, totally. And, and you just think, this is not going to go right. Why am I doing this? Why have this? I done this to myself? <laughs> Absolutely, that feeling. That is your intuition saying like a big no, no, no. These people are not worth your time and you're, you're going to waste each other's time and it's far better to say no um, and use that time to find a client who's going to value you than, than do a rubbish search. And so you've worked with some customers that you've really helped change that cultural perception um, of you know managing and empowering that recruiter to be able to say no because I think there's also a little bit of fuel factor for a recruiter to come back to their manager and actually say, no, I didn't want that business. And they're sort of like going, why, you know? Um, the steps that that sort of helps with these customers you've worked with to try and, and help that recruiter to empower them to actually assess the customer and say, no, can you give me some sort of examples of how that's worked? Yeah, so um, I guess a really good example would be a lady, or a lady, a director and a founder of a recruitment business called Cressida, uh-huh. um, who I've been working with for about six months now. Now, she came to me in like the thick of lockdown when things were pretty tough and um, she was kind of tempted to work on, can I say crap? I'm going to say crap. Work on, any, <laughs> work on any old assignments just to try and you know, she had that real scarcity mindset where she was just desperate to get some fees. And I think we've all all felt that kind of scary feeling over the past year or so. She she found the strength to draw a line under the assignments and say, good luck with it, but I'm not going to be able to fill these for you and kind of drew a line under them all. Um, then really, really, I worked with her to kind of really work out who she wanted to work with, where she could best add value. Um, and she's gone on to absolutely smash it this quarter. She's kind of doubled her revenue goals um, by taking that time to really, really think about, you know, intentionally who she wanted to work with. And the really, really interesting thing as well is that by saying no to these particular, um, the old clients, and she, I think she actually put a post on LinkedIn saying, these are, these are my adult clients, this, these are my company values, this is who I want to work with. It actually attracted um, a whole new class of clients to her, um, which she got on exclusive and retained business. So, Fantastic. yes, there was a bit of a dip where she was kind of like, oh, my God, have I done the right thing? Um, but it's it's kind of come back to her um, threefold. She's a lot happier as well. I was going to say, you know, doing business with better clients that are aligning with you is much more satisfying as well. Oh, God, yeah. So do you help your customers sort of align it just purely on values or, you know, are you looking at the type of business that they actually, you know, are good at filling and sort of, you know, because we do get a lot of, there's a lot of companies out there that, you know, fill different roles. The company might be great, but they do different roles all over the place that aren't necessarily their expertise. You know, how do you sort of split it up when you're working with sort of owners to try and help them to do this? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, all the the basic niching rules still apply. So you need to know your ideal customer avatar. So you need to know your industry. You need to know your um, your, your sector. You need to know the job roles. You need to know your salary benchmarking, all that kind of stuff, all the skills. You need to know the kind of approaches that work for you. 
But I think that's where most recruiters stop. Yeah. And what I'm proposing is that we go a few layers deeper um, and work out that, that. There's an exercise I do called empathy mapping which is all about really getting inside the head of potential clients and understanding how they think, what keeps them awake at night, um, what their challenges are, what they're angry about, what they what their, their vision is and their why and all that kind of stuff. And, oh, my gosh, you, could, you should see the powerful meetings that people have when clients realise they are working with a recruiter who genuinely really really cares about their their business and what they're trying to achieve it's just it's just a whole new level of satisfaction it is it's asking those questions like right you know what what has really annoyed you or you know what really excites you when you meet a candidate and we are in the talent game and the people game it, it should be obvious for us to do and dig that deeper but but for some reason i think we've just lost that <sighs> It, it, it's it's time scarcity and it's financial scarcity. Um, I think there's a lot of legacy behaviours in the recruitment industry. I mean, I'm old enough to know, remember the recession sort of 2008, 2009, when it all got a little bit sharky in the industry. You know, uh, corners were cut. Um, people were kind of desperate to get a fee in terms were uh, reduced, all that kind of stuff. Um, and I think there is a danger that that's going to happen again if we're not smart about it and not really intentional about how we do business intentional is a great word there it's because it means that you've got a plan really doesn't it and i think that's if it's a sort of takeaway that i would be taking from today is you know we can get really but you know we've gone from you know furloughed our staff to bringing them back from a recruitment point of view um, and then suddenly it's just like somebody's turned the tap on and everyone is so busy i mean we have you know all our clients are reporting brilliant first quarters um, so if you don't recognise um, the intentional game of how you're going to actually convert the business and stay on track, it could be, it's like a tsunami hitting you and you're just then going into headless chicken mode again. I think that's where you can get really, really smart at the moment. So it, it, intentional to me means both goal setting, but also a faith piece as well. Not in like a religious way, but in kind of a, um, we are going to hit our vision. We don't need to panic. We don't need to work 24 hours a day to service all these clients. We need to we need to live our values. Say one of your values is only working with clients who um, you're really excited to receive phone calls from at 10.30 at night. Then you're not overwhelmed because I bet there's about 50% of the job orders that you currently have on that you could say no thank you to. And it gets to it dead easy. It's setting that parameters out and giving it almost in a, a sto- you know, a, a sort of scorecard or assessment card for your recruiters to then follow and ask that same questions as well, um, which I think is, is is really helpful. I, I had a I had a story. I remember very vividly. I was asked into um, a company in Glasgow, and I they were looking for salespeople. It was a tech company. Um, and they basically were saying, well, we don't want a female, we don't want this, we don't want that. And I just couldn't believe what I was hearing. And I always remember that I astounded him because I was a female recruiting that person. And I just said, thanks very much, but no thanks, and walked out. Um, really? Yeah, and, and I, I I felt great after doing it because it was the sort of values that you were doing, and I just don't think we do that enough. But, you know, that reflected, that wasn't appropriate to be asking a recruiter for all those demands, you know? Do you know, that's so common in the industry though, because you told that story and it took me straight back to a memory of my very early days in recruitment, sort of 2005, 2006. Um, so I was working for a startup then, and we were recruiting salespeople, mm-hmm. um, and I took a job order very with very similar um, parameters, and I took it. I was like, oh, yeah. you know, it, it never occurred to me to push back to a client and say, hang on a minute, you can't say that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think I think that kind of attitude really shaped my early career in recruitment. I think it's still I think it's still a problem in the industry. I, I'm absolutely certain it is. And until we change, because we're the facilitators, um, and I think until we change in terms of saying, well, actually, that's not right. And no, this is, you know, we've, um, you know, we've got to look at, well, we're both two females that are successful at what we're doing. Does that mean that we couldn't do a sales job for that company? That's not, you know, but in certain roles, I had another extreme where another client would only ever look at somebody that had a first class from a certain university as well. Um, And I was like trying to say, well, actually, you know, half the people that I've employed that are very successful wouldn't get a job with you, you know? So it's, I think it's using that sort of 
um, examples back to um, politely challenge their views, isn't it? Yeah, I think I think challenge is a great word there, and it's what I always encourage people to do because in, in that sort of scenario, if you challenge back at them, um, the great question that I always use in coaching is, "What are you making that mean? What story are you telling yourself about why that first class degree is important?" And you will either uncover some valuable information that you can get on, you can then go on to use to to recruit successfully. So it could be that they want someone who's got advanced reasoning skills, just for example, and in their mind, a first class degree equates to that. So you could go and find somebody who's got first class reasoning skills, but just hasn't got the uh, certification for it. Um, So you know that's a big tick in the client box. Or they get the hump with you for pushing back and you know not to waste your time with them. So you will care about that. Yeah, I think that's that's the main thing, because, you know, it'll be somebody else's problem chasing down, you know, skill sets that are very um, short in supply and they're just going to keep chasing them down, aren't they, as well? And it's having confidence that, you know, your supply market, that you are able to do that. That's I think that's where I got it as a recruiter in that if I knew my candidate market that well, that what was available and what was not available, then ultimately that can also help drive those situations because they're asking for something that you just can't find. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I think it comes back to valuing the service that we bring as well and really, really knowing that that, that, that we can change lives. Mm-hmm. Um, just as, a, I guess, a small example of that. So I work with values-led recruitment leaders to help them, yeah, have amazing financial success, but also um, I don't work with people who are all about the money. It's about them, people who want to level up and change the world as well. So let me just get the statistics right on this. So if I work with 250 senior recruiters in my group programs, those senior recruiters then have seven hires, seven people in their companies. Those seven people then make 15 placements a year. That's 26,500 people, lives that can be changed just from this conversation that you and I are having today. And that's that's awesome. It's absolutely awesome. And I don't think enough recruiters say, you know what, I do a damn good job and... I would really, really love it if we could get to a space where recruitment is seen as a vocation rather than something you fall into. <laughs> How many times have you heard that? You interview somebody, oh, I just fell into it. Um, I would love it if we could respect it enough that it's as, as vocational as, as law or medicine or something like that. Mm-hmm. And it, it did. It, it, I mean, it does. I think we've got a long journey to go, but it is. But then, you know, if this industry wasn't, you know, worth something, why are we still in it after 20, 15 years? Because there's something you get into it and it gets under your blood, which is which is great. What's your favourite bit of the recruitment process? I, I'm not bothered about the making the placements and stuff. That, that to me is just detail. For me, the magic comes when after the first interview and you take the client feedback and you, you take the candidate feedback and you know you've made the match. But you kind of do it when you set the interview up, but you just, after you get the feedback, you just know it and you know you've changed those two people's lives and you can't bottle that. You definitely can. And for me, it was that um, when an email came in from a candidate that you knew was right, I would kiss the screen every time. <laughs> I go hello <laughs> and there is there's lots of those things that I think we you know we, we've got to get back into this is why we really enjoy it but let's do it on our terms as well and let's let's change these um you know help these businesses grow but you know use our time more effectively um to actually fill fill those jobs that you ex, you know you're enjoying actually working with those customers out of interest like in the companies that you've worked with, um, well, and I know it's very difficult, sort of temp, perms, everything else, but how many roles do you think that you can be effective as a recruiter per week to be at, you know, actually working? Oh, now there's a question. I have always liked to do really deep campaign-led searches. I'm not sure why, because it's wild to actually recruit myself, but the number two is coming up for me, two, two a week. Okay. Um, and then getting them to an extent of actually shortlisting or moving forward, you know, from start to finish almost there in terms of getting a shortlist, camp, you know, through. Yeah, absolutely. And to, be, and to be clear, my background is senior perm searches. Okay. Mm-hmm. So obviously if it was temp or contract, then you'd want a lot more than that. But to, in, in my mind, a proper deep campaign headhunting search. Yeah, it is too. 
So when you yeah. put that into context, so I think the survey um, is about 47% were sort of saying that, um, you know, one to six. And I kind of thought, thought well, they hadn't defined it by, and actually it was, it was um, Hazel that if she's out there, it was her her um, LinkedIn poll that I was referring to there. Okay. Um, so she, um, I think she was doing about 47% were running about one to six roles. And because it hadn't been defined temp contract, I thought, yeah, that's, that's fairly fairly good but when you go back to like deep roles of retained positions one to two well think about that in terms of you know there isn't much more that you can do so if you're wasting time with those one to two roles that you hate working for that client that's going to drain your negative like that's just going to drain your energy of actually sort of wanting to jump into your job and enjoy what you're doing isn't it yeah i mean it comes back to financial goals obviously if you're working for somebody else it's slightly different you've got a, a monthly target God, I can't even remember what monthly targets were. It's been that long since I've been employed, but it's seven years now. But um, if you're an independent, then it's slightly different. Let, let's say 10K for argument's sake, and your average placement, well, mine was about 10K. So that's one role a month I had to yeah. fill. Yeah. So if I was really, really selective about who I wanted to work with and only worked on roles that just got me jumping around with, like, I can absolutely smash there, yeah. just think how much value I could be adding with the rest of my time. Yeah, no, exactly. Uh, so stuff that I've done that's really made a difference to my industry, podcasts, um, setting up networks, setting up communities, all that stuff that you can do to actually make a difference above and beyond just making your placement. Mm -hmm. Well, about that in terms of setting up your community, it's been really interesting because you've got the authentic recruiter community. Tell us a little bit more about that. So I basically, me getting on my soapbox, thinking Mm -hmm. authentic recruiters need to change lives. Surely there must be other people out there Uh, who think the same as me, who want to um, collaborate, not compete. And I think that's one of the negative perceptions of the industry that we need to change, is that recruiters are all competing against each other and we all hate each other and we have scraps in bars if we ever meet and that kind of thing. Um, But I just think there's a lot of merit in like-minded people coming together to ask questions in a safe space. I mean, inside the community, we've had questions like, how do I do this? A client's thrown this curveball at me. What do I do? Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's kind of people jumping on to say, oh, have you tried this? Or here's this resource and whatever it is. I tried this in my industry. And it's really lovely and it's really affirming. Those people have never met each other, um, but just genuinely, are genuinely passionate about the recruitment industry um, and want to level up together. Yeah, no, it's, it is. It's... Um... I, I'm, you know, we have, we, we were brought up very much competing with one another and it's, um, you know, there is, there is a whole different way because you, to be a great recruiter, I believe you are a niche recruiter. Um, so you can only be a great recruiter in one sort of sector of the market, but there's lots of other, um, you know, opportunities to collaborate with recruiters at their niche as well. If we just open that sort of door and start to help one another. Well, just imagine, so if we're talking about sacking our clients who don't fit with our values yeah um just because they don't fit with our values it doesn't mean that they don't fit with somebody else's down the road and you can refer them on and they might be a perfect match for them and if we can operate that way then perceptions of the industry are only going to go up um our opportunities to learn and collaborate are only going to go up and it's it's just a nicer way to behave it is well, you mentioned financial targets because, um, you know, let's face it, the majority of our audience are still driven and, and should be because they're commercial organisations by financial targets. So, you know, this sounds great. It's all very idealistic. We're all going to be friends with one another and we're all going to just pick our own clients and only work with them. But does it actually pay off in terms of value and financial targets? Yeah, absolutely. It does. I mean, um, Cressida, I mentioned before, she's, uh, I think it's uh, tripled her um, her targets for this quarter just by taking that time to slow down to speed up and only working with people who she really really believes in um, and I think it's really important to point out that just because we're talking about um, being values driven it's not about being fluffy it's about wanting something that's bigger than just buying a new house and a new car it's about knowing what your why is and then using that um that, that money that you're making, you know, those brilliant deals that you're making to to impact the world. Um, I'm a big believer in charging what you're worth. I think there's a lot of money mindset issues uh, that are going on, particularly with, with, with female entrepreneurs, actually, um, and that we should be charging a professional fee for what we do because it's a professional service. So I've, 
you know, please be really, really clear that when we're talking about being values led, we want to get rewarded appropriately for what we're doing as well. Yeah. And and yeah, definitely, you know, um, and, and, and in terms of like the actually growing a business and scaling a business around that, because you know, a lot of owners will be feeling very comfortable that that's their, you know, a lot of it is their values that they put into your company. How do you make sure that you're also attracting those recruiters that will feel comfortable that that becomes their values of who they deal with as well? That's where you get to have fun with it. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you, if say if you're a, an independent recruiter who's ready to scale their company, um, once you are really, really clear on your own personal values and how that shows up in terms of behaviours and actions, you know, how does that mean in terms of your your KPIs? What does that mean in terms of the, the, the hours that you work, all that kind of thing? That's when you can start to create culture. Mm-hmm. Um, so you're not just using it to attract your clients, you're using it to attract your employees as well. And then when you can articulate that story, um, you can put that on your website, you can put that in a video on LinkedIn. And your people will come to you because the people that need to be employed by you um, will hear that story and connect with that. And that's when you get employees who who match with what you're trying to achieve, who buy into that. And then they're not just employees, they're part of your story. Yeah. And and I think that is, it's the, the take of everybody should be, as you're growing a business, adding to that culture as well, which is which is awesome, which is really good. So I think a big part of this is about getting visible because in order to have this why in this story, you need to then sort of shout about it to be able to attract the right, the right business to you as well. Um, so this is another area of your passion of, of, of how you get visible um, and take that. And I think you're, you've got a course running. Yeah. So the um, it's free coaching series. It's about visibility and learning how to use your voice in an authentic way. So if you're listening to this and you're thinking, well, that's all well and good, but I've been trying to recruit in one way for so long how on earth do I change things and show up authentically and still kind of um get my point across mm-hmm. um so it's a visibility coaching series we start on the 7th of June and it's totally free it's me coaching for 30 minutes a day in the evening so it doesn't interfere with the J job um I think uh, Amy is popping a link in there to um to sign up to it um, it's going to be absolutely amazing. I ran it back in um, in April, and it was just phenomenal. Like the people that we got on were just passion led, heart led, values led, high achieving leaders, and um, it was a fantastic crowd. And if people want to sign up to it, it's it's going to be absolutely amazing. Do you know what though? Somebody like that, you know, like yourself, doing that for free and getting that sort of coaching out. And Amy has. She's just um, it's just above the Lizzie. Thank you for your comment there as well. Um, the authentic uh, recruiter clear actor slash visibility dash challenge there you go um so yeah no i think i think that's awesome that you're doing that because um you know the more support we can have for everybody here as well is just it, it's it's really good so look, just finishing up because i think we've been you've given us a different way of thinking about things and that's what i like to bring on to the show so i'm really glad that you're able to join us um but i always like um you know giving a couple of takeaways that you know people can can go and I, obviously i think the first one's go and sign up for your course that's there that's there but a couple of takeaways just now somebody's listening to this and thinking i need to sort of just actually even write down you know what my values are what what would you advise so i have um created a little pdf especially for you especially for people watching this um which is called 10 ways to know you're working with the wrong recruitment clients um so that i think um, amy's got a link for that as well if anyone wants to go and get that it's completely my gift to you. you don't need to sign up for anything for it um, but hopefully that'll prompt a conversation and you'll think, hang on a minute, I can do things differently here. Um, and then reach out to me and we can talk about working together. <laughs> that sounds awesome. I think a scorecard is a really good way of just sort of making yourself question on your different areas. So thank you for putting that together. And I'm sure we'll be doing a bit of follow up as well. So we'll have a look at that and sort of work that into summer content as well, Claire. Listen, thank you so much for joining us. Um, it has been um, it has been really really good to think about things in a different way because you you started off being a super impressed recruiter you know in with all the sort of um big companies there and then have just taken a step back yourself um and thought no this can be done differently and now you're on a mission to help so so i, I you know change other people's way of doing recruitment and changing the progress the, the the actual sort of industry as well so i'm 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 in awe of what you're doing and um thank you keep doing that as well Oh, I think it's inviting you, Wendy. Oh, and it's a pleasure, Claire. Um, next time we've got on for everybody that has um, joined in, thank you for joining in. And, and it's actually quite well linked in terms of what Claire's been talking about when she was talking 
about actually collaborating with other users. So um, for everybody that knows us, I'm a very advert, um, uh, me and um, Firefish, we're a very big supporter of the team network, which is the largest independent group of recruiters. Um, and they all work together. So they all use one another. They're all independent, but they all actually work in teams together to fill client requirements. So it's a really good sort of way of looking at can networking actually help grow your own business with other competing recruiters? So we're going to attack that with uh, Simon Bliss, who's taken over the team network in the next couple of weeks, uh, just before the bank holiday, which I'm sure everybody's looking forward to as well. But thank you for tuning, tuning in. As always, if you've got any other topics you'd like me to address, please um, drop me a wee note. Uh, you can get me on LinkedIn um, and all the usual sort of emails or um, through the Firefish Network as well. But thank you very much and have a lovely rest of the week. Thank you, Claire.